Welcome everyone, it's Cool Canada's Virtual Kitchen. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, oh my god, too much caffeine? Anyways, we have a great show lined up. It's the Restaurant Side Hustle Show, as we call it. I'm going to bring this rock legend in here uh, right now. Karen, welcome back hey. to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So, Karen, this time I forgot to mention we're also live on TikTok right now, too. So, hi to my oh, TikTok, hey. TikTok crew. Um, but anyways, so Karen, today's all about packaging. We have a packaging legend on the show um, <laughs> in relationship to food inflation. So thank you for tweaking the show a little bit to really address food inflation and all the things that are happening out there. And I think I'm excited to talk to Lisa about, Lisa, I hope you're prepared in the green room uh, about all the crazy stuff we're going to ask you about packaging. Um, but anyways, Karen, do you want to tell us a little bit about Food Venture Program? Because you have one of the coolest companies out there helping people. <laughs> Thanks. Um, that's really sweet. So, yeah, I'm one of the co-founders of Food Venture Program. Um, I... <laughs> I think you froze. Karen? Uh oh first glitch let's try to move that music hi hey, Karen <laughs> alright we're going to break for a quick commercial and see if Karen can come back in a second Be right back. Cisco Classic High Performance Nitro Gloves Cisco Classic High Performance Nitro Gloves are great for back of the house tasks such as chopping and slicing, working around moderate heat, or customer-facing operations. They offer an elegant look and superior protection for any culinary application where touch dexterity, cut protection, and presentation are key. Cisco Classic High Performance Nitro Gloves have superb tensile strength plus a flexible form-fitting design. They are an ideal barrier protection when working around moderate heat, oil, and chemicals. They can be used for cleaning and sanitizing in the front or back of the house. They're available in black and cobalt blue for any HACCP programs. They are great for detail-oriented tasks and are compliant with all FDA regulations for safe food contact. Nitro gloves offer the right protection for the wearer when performing precision tasks that require long wear and a fitted grip. Cisco Classic High Performance Nitro Gloves are available for order today. See your local Cisco representative for more information. Hey, Lisa. <laughs> Welcome to the show. We lost Karen. Uh-oh. Karen, Karen's an internet. It was her fancy <laughs> mic. Anyways, we'll bug her when she comes back. No but problem. welcome to the show, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. It's super exciting. So first of all, can you share a little bit about the company, who you are, all this great stuff that you do in this space, which is very exciting for us to talk about today? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. My name is Lisa Cove. I own Co-Motion Packaging Solutions, um, which I started a couple of years ago, uh, really to address the gaps there is founders need when they're starting out. So entrepreneurs, restaurants who want to take something to market. Um, there's a lot of information out there that's kind of held by people who work at uh, in management levels at large corporations who are already on the store shelves. And I wanted to be able to bring that knowledge to um, the starting up and scaling up food businesses. So at Comotion, I do that in the form in two umbrellas. So uh, food packaging and food safety. Those are my two areas of expertise. Um, so I think you have some questions today, probably about food safety, but of course, packaging up food products as well. I spent my career working for um, large corporations like Ferrero Canada, uh, where we manufactured Rocher, Tic Tac and Nutella. Um, and that has since- Well, well, wait a minute. You said yeah. Nutella. Yes. I asked you earlier if you had a cool packaging story. <laughs> Oh, well, that's cool. you that's know cool. what? Because sometimes the packaging that went on Nutella was dreadful for the for the buyers. It was hard for us to uh, to source really well and to find good printers for that stuff. So yeah, it's great on the retail shelf, but it's a little bit more difficult on the back end. Nice. So nice. I have a little you know, bit of uh, reservations about some of that packaging. Okay, well we're gonna get down to it. <laughs> It's yeah. like deep talk with Lisa and packaging. <laughs> you Anyways, want to know the we truth, do have, yeah. <laughs> exactly, we'll know the truth. 
Yeah. I hope you're not. There's Karen. She's back. Hi. Karen, you disappeared. <laughs> I don't know if it was my yes. fancy music. No, I uh, have satellite internet. I live out in the country and sometimes it just that just had to happen at the worst moment. I'm sorry. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Blame we, we, Elon we did, Musk. We did, a, we did a glove commercial, so don't worry. <laughs> good. You're awesome. Anyways, so Karen, do you want to share a little bit? I think you were getting into what Food Venture Program is and what you do over there. And maybe that connects us to Lisa, and then we'll get into gr gr grilling Lisa and some questions. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know where I got cut off, but essentially Food Venture Program offers um, educational programs and consulting to food product owners across North America. Um, we are based in Canada and um, we have a whole team of experts that join us for our programming and they teach in our programs. Um, so Lisa is one of them and she's our go-to expert for packaging and food safety as well. Cool. Um, and yeah, kind of like where I came into this business is I have a food product of my own and being a dietitian as well. Um, I used to do a lot of food product labeling consulting um, from the health aspect of things. And that's really long story short, how I got into doing what I'm doing now as one of the co-founders of Food Venture Program. Very cool. So so obviously like over the, over this month and next month, we've been talking about inflation and we're going to come up with solutions and stuff. I have some, I think is really cool. And I love the questions you sent in, Karen, is really around this area. So um, I'm going to direct this to Karen first. So Karen, in your area of work, what are you seeing right now restaurants are doing right now to combat food inflation? Yeah, so um, as you know, we really focus on food product development. But it's really interesting because in 2020, when we first actually started this business, um, we had mostly people that were either like retiring from their jobs and were looking to start a food product as a kind of side business. But further into the pandemic, as you all probably know, a lot of restaurant owners were looking for alternative ways of making income. And one of the biggest ways that we saw um, was food or restaurant owners turning their recipes into food products. So um, that became our biggest client was restaurant owners. And to this day still, even though restaurants are opening back up, it seems like this is still a trend where you know, popular recipes from restaurants are being turned into CPG or as we know them as consumer packaged goods. So they're selling them on their retail, sorry, on their own store shelves in their restaurants, um, maybe at the checkout counter, or they're just kind of like on shelves within the store as part of the decor in the store as well, or sorry, in the restaurant. And then of course, once they kind of use that space, to see how well their product does and you know if there's a really demand for it and if they can get sales from just selling in their own restaurants, then they're starting to look for distributors and selling beyond just the restaurant front, um, restaurant shop front. Um, and then going beyond that to like selling through distributors like Cisco or getting onto store shelves at Loblaws and stuff like that. So um, yeah, it's really interesting how kind of the tide changed during the pandemic. Jay, you're oh. muted. That was a bad, I did that this time. <laughs> nice job, Lisa. Um, so I was going to say, Karen, that a lot of restaurants were talking with us on their packaging, like um, sauces and dressings and different things like that to pull that extra income into this. So I'm going to throw this to, to Lisa. So if, if a restaurant has a really good product right now and they want to package it up, What's that legal process look like? Because there's got to be some legal stuff they got to do. They can't just, you know, whip it up at home and throw it in a bottle and slap a label on it. Because I'm sure there's people that have tried that. There was a probably... lot of people that tried that during the pandemic, that? actually. So I think uh, you did see a huge growth in kind of home-based businesses. But specifically going to the restaurant side of it, yes, absolutely, restaurants can do this. The good news is that the system is there. Um, for restaurants who already have an approved commercial kitchen, you know, public health comes in and inspects it. You're completely allowed to make a product, bottle it up and uh, sell it to your customers. And the idea is built around that it's going to be sold kind of in the local market or somewhere within your province. Um, and, you know, so that, that still remains relatively local. If you don't have enough space to do it within your own kitchen, you may consider mm -hmm. uh 
you know, renting a commercial kitchen that has a little bit more room or perhaps some packaging equipment that you might use to speed up the process, um, or you might farm it out to a co-manufacturer, which is something else we see done. But at the end of the day, uh, if you have a commercial kitchen or a, a restaurant that's approved by public health, yes, you absolutely can bottle up your products, but just make sure that you're considering things like shelf life and um, your labels at least got some information on it um, that will make it a little bit safe for your consumer. And if there's any handling instructions that they require. Lisa, is that the same for like these uh, community markets? That a restaurant may take a product to those community markets does that still apply to this yeah absolutely so in order to be able to sell at a market farmer's market or something like mm -hmm. that uh, yeah. you definitely want to uh, make sure that you have public health inspections so um, a lot of there is a, an exemption for uh, to make some food at home they're called cottage food products they're not really written in law but certain things like baked goods or candies or sweets some people are making them in their home and packaging them up as long as they've notified health canada or sorry public health and got a sign off on it but in yeah. terms of your restaurant you can absolutely do that but the process is the same you must have like that a plus check mark from public health uh, to be able to take it to the markets and and get that sign off just to show that you made it in a kitchen that's safe and that you have like food handler certificate things like that so you understand food safety to to the minimum amount at least the bare minimum yeah well you know i'm gonna because okay first of all i got a lot of questions <laughs> prepare yourself yeah but no is there any foods that are exempt from this like that may not you know what you don't need it because i'm sure there is yeah, well, so that's what I was saying with the with the cottage food laws, actually, that um, there are some food products that you can make in the in your own home as long as you've notified public health. So baked goods, candies, things like that, chocolate. You can look up cottage food laws. That's the term you want to uh, you know throw into. But that's what it's bin. called, cottage, cottage food, food laws. Yeah, cottage food laws. Um, it's different in every jurisdiction, so make sure you check your own local. Uh, public health to make sure um, every province is different and in the U.S. every state is different as well. Um, but you know in terms of uh, anything outside of that cottage you really need to have that commercial kitchen in place. I know that during the pandemic we did see a rise in some people starting businesses uh, just to kind of make ends meet or to just fill that gap of time that they had or whatever. They had that creative outlet and it was going into food but we want to make sure that From I you know you know you can tell us <laughs> I, I can tell you, you the experience from my own experience just having a food product of my own um but on average like from each sale of my own product and we actually teach this in our programs um that Thank you, you. want to have at least 30 percent of your product like 30 percent markup so that you profit 30 percent on every single product that you sell and so we can translate that to restaurant owners as well so um is that, is that average yes. like Karen, that's like a like that's a rule of like thumb like 30 percent because that's pretty good it, it's you a rule of thumb pretty. that yeah we teach that as a rule of thumb but um we do have entrepreneurs that that make like 60 percent um of their cost as well so i mean it depends on how you you know how you're pricing and where you're sourcing your products from and Lisa can probably attest to this, but packaging tends to be one of the most costly um, pieces of the product compared to your ingredients. So usually it's okay, the well, packaging. Wait a whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. <laughs> now we're going to walk down a different question here. And Lisa, this is going to involve you. Because is single use plastics fall into this space too on the bands that are coming out? Not yet. So that's a no with an second. if and a yes with you a but. <laughs> You said not yet. That's okay, right. So. Yes. 
there is exactly. full, there is full intention in Canada to remove any sort of single use plastic or hard to recycle plastic. Yeah. Um, so and unfortunately, that the world of food packaging is immensely made up of that uh, single use plastic. Is it? Is right. it actually in, like in the packaging? It is. Hey, like you can't you can't use that. So it's so not, now. <laughs> Sorry, I got a lot of questions here. About recycling, we'll have a whole other show because it's exactly. a whole other realm, to be honest. But um, I'll speak to the point that you know the single-use plastic in the in the industry. It's not that it can't necessarily be recycled in the food packaging world. It's that the system isn't designed to recycle all of it. So okay. recycling is a for-profit business, and people have to make money off of recycling. And if there's no call for buying recycled material, it doesn't get purchased, which means it doesn't get properly recycled. So that's a caveat. <laughs> right now, the ban covers your forks, your knives, uh, your straws, yeah. plastic bags, that sort of thing. Oh, yeah. We've had a show on it. So yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, I, that's why I'm asking the question on it. Because yeah. We've had a show recently on it last week. We have another one coming up. But I just want to ask about it because when I'm thinking about restaurants putting their products in different things, is there a is there a rule of thumb of what they should be considering when it comes to sauces and dressings and that stuff? Like they can't just put it in any container? Did they no. have to go through a process on what? Because I'm sure, once again, some people have probably put it in anything that you saw maybe through the pandemic. <laughs> so, yeah. So, okay. There's a couple things there. So you may be tempted to just package it up. Depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to just put a product in, a, in your refrigerator and have something take home, like a little bit of sauce in a small plastic container for yep. your customer to take home, any container will do. When you're trying to have a product that's shelf stable, which means you're going to be able to sell it three months from now, and it just sits in it without refrigeration on the in the decor, as Kieran said, um, you have to process it in a way to make it shelf stable, which means that yeah. jar has to be sealed properly. Typically, we see glass, glass jars um, with metal lids because they can yep. be heat sealed and uh, properly treated so that they seal properly and they're shelf stable. So um, you absolutely want to do your research on that if you're trying to get something to be shelf stable shelf stable work with an, a consultant if you need to or do your research online to make sure just like home canning like picture you're canning something at home or making a sauce at home and you want it to last for the entire yeah. year you need to seal it with a water bath the concepts are relatively the same so uh, maybe this is both for both questions for you so we know that there's probably a lot of these things that are going on that people maybe didn't go through the right processes who monitors that? Is that the health board or the local regional health boards or or who who watches to make sure people are doing the right things in this space? Who wants to jump on that, Karen? Um, well, it's from it's public health really that Okay, will... public health, okay. Mhm. Mm um, so yeah, it is it is regional. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Lisa. Yeah, I, I can speak to this point too, because uh, just in terms of the markets and things like that, when you go to a farmer's market, what you'll see is public health will actually walk around a farmer's market and they'll ask to see your uh, certificate. Really? Yep, they will. And they'll, um, you know, if you don't have that piece of paper that says this restaurant or this food product was made at a certified kitchen, they can shut you down. You may even receive fines depending on your local market. So um, you want to follow all the rules of your local farmer's market. Um, you know, whatever it be fire suppression for your food truck or whatever it might be that they yeah. require of you, but just make sure you've got your ducks in a row. It's super simple to get public health approval as long as yeah. you're following good food handling uh, procedure. So um, definitely if you're at the local market, if you're selling something at a store, um, of course, they're not gonna, public health can't be everywhere at, at every time. So, um, but someone could report you to public health as well. It's just like having a restaurant open without that that stamp of approval. Yeah. On the Same thing, you might fly under the radar for a short period of time, but eventually- well, they'll, get well, they'll, they'll, get they'll get you. They'll get you for sure. <laughs> the just thing is later. though, like it, as a restaurant owner, it's it's almost like easier to do to get a food product out there because you already have should have yeah. public health certification. Yeah. You should already have your food handler certificate. Um, you, you're pretty much 50 percent the way there. You just need to find a packaging, discover how you want your branding and design on your package to look so. Um, with our food entrepreneurs that we get, maybe 50% of them are not restaurant owners and they don't have a space to produce. So as a restaurant owner, you're already there because you have the space to, 
to produce legally. So um, it's not too big of an issue with food or restaurant owners. So it's a good thing. So, so that's a thing that I think we should put a shout out to all the restaurants out there. Because one, if you're making 30 points on addressing they're already doing, because the food inflation right now is, uh, is, is, is very tight for restaurants and you know the profitability and the profits of poor, poor people is very short. Um, this is a great opportunity because you got the kitchen, you got the manpower. Um, maybe this is for Karen as well. Lisa, both of you, you're both brilliant in this space. Is it a lot of work? Like if I said, you know, I got Jay sauce, I'm in a restaurant, I got this barbecue sauce I've been doing for a while. I'm like, I want to put it in a package, I want to sell it. We'll talk about the retail side here in a second, how to get into retail. But before I start that process, I know I can make 30 points. Is it a lot of work? Like, am I going to invest a lot of work in this space, or is it just a little less? Or is it a lot? Oh, I, I can. You want to talk about that one? Well, that's a, that was a big question. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> It's a big question. So, it, you know, it depends on how involved you want to get because you have a small scale food product CPG brand, and then you can scale all the way up to trying to get into the large retail stores. So if you are just trying to put something uh, on the shelves, um, it's a, a little bit of investment in uh, learning. So there's going to be learning curves um, and packaging, packaging design and your branding. Uh, as well as just the, the general cost of, um, of designing it. Maybe if you're not a graphic designer, you're probably going to pay a designer to design your packaging for you just so you have a good brand um, and, you know, go from there. Starting out at that first level, I would say totally worth it for someone who already has, in terms of that cost question we were talking about earlier, if you don't have the cost of a commercial kitchen, you're saving big. And that's why you can have that uh, 30 point on a, on a bottle of sauce because Commercial kitchens rent out by the hour. So someone who doesn't already have that advantage, mm -hmm. imagine you can only produce 25 bottles of sauce in an hour and it costs you X number of dollars per hour plus whatever rental fees they charge you. There's always mm -hmm. some, something added on, right? So if you have that already, you have a huge advantage to kind of take it and roll with it. It's, you know, there's more to do once you want to get to the national level for your food product. Um, which you can absolutely, you know, invest a lot more money and a lot more time if you want to scale it up to the retail level. Now, is it as easy as I see on the Dragon's Den? Because I always see it on the Dragon's Den and then they're like, oh, yeah, we sold this and they make no money. Is that because they go into retail maybe at the wrong angle or they don't use people like yourself or Karen? Like, is that why? It's Because it, usually I hear, I hear it all the time. Every day I see, I watch it and it's just like, ooh. And I think Karen, this is the one thing before you answer that. I want to say this because Karen may think I don't listen. But you know what she said last show was you got to go into the grocery aisle. You got to look at what's not there and what is. Because a lot of people think that they can create another barbecue sauce. Well, there's a barbecue sauce galore <laughs> in some of these doors. Do you need another barbecue sauce, right? So anyways, <laughs> there's just see Karen, I listen to you. <laughs> that, well, like in terms of that question, that's a really good point that there's your if and if you want to get in the store shelves and be on uh you know Loblaw shelves you have to push yeah. something else out um you're not going there they don't create new space for you they create you know they put you in and take something else out so you have to be really good you have to have a value proposition that puts you above somebody else's food product and oftentimes it's down to taste and branding and uh, how you've built your brand um, and you have to show the retailers sales in order to get that space you have to get like you know into the something that okay. makes you different from everyone else so lisa does that's those sales then like let's say and <laughs> i know i'm gonna get shot for this but is for restaurants, they carried the sauce, they went through the process, they got the packaging and everything else. They don't have any sales, because, or they have very minimal because they've been trying to sell it through their restaurant. Maybe it's on their menu, maybe it's on their tables. Um, but then they go over to Amazon. So you know what? I, I want to sell on Amazon to get because I hear that all the time on the sharks on the sharks tank. Is that a good way to go, or is it better to go through like the farmers market route and start small and retail, local small grocery stores or things like that? Which way would you recommend? Yeah, there's a that's an open debate. You know, Amazon, it, think about yourself and your own purchasing. Do you buy a lot of groceries through Amazon? There are obviously people who are doing it. 
Um, and it is really good for the starting out. Uh, there's questions about how much you're actually making in, in markup and all that stuff. Like, what are you actually coming home with at the end? But it's great for brand building and it's great mm -hmm. to demonstrate sales to a buyer at a grocery store. Um, you may do two things in conjunction. That's what I see a lot where I see people doing the hands-on markets where they're yeah. actually handing out samples to people, try my sauce, try my sauce. Yeah. And then they're also on Amazon and they have a good social media presence because that's so important. So that is that is definitely the question right now, whether or not, um, I don't know if like, you know that uh, Whole Foods is owned by Amazon and it's kind of mm. like they bought that grocery store in order to yep. you know, feed that need because people aren't still aren't 100% online buying their groceries. So, but it oh, is yeah. a good way to demonstrate sales beforehand so you can have something to take to the to the grocery store or to the no, yeah, buyers. Well, you mentioned on there, you mentioned a little bit about social media and that's something that, you know, I live and breathe and it seems like nowadays is, um, so I, I got a sauce. I'm just going to go through the process. I, I went through the process. I met with Karen. She told me what to do. I got all the sauces. I got the right packaging, got the laws, got everything there. I've tried Amazon. Um, now I said, you know, we got to go over social because I see that all the time is that a lot of success on the social media side for creating some buzz and hype around your products. Do restaurants and stuff like that, would they would they hire someone or is it better to just use themselves or would they go to an influencer model? What's the suggestion, Karen? Uh, do you mean for the do? Do sales? Do? do you mean for the sales side of things? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, to be honest, just from experience and seeing our own entrepreneurs um, and their success, it, it's really nice for the people on like the receiving side of the pitch, like for example, you go to a grocery store, they actually appreciate hearing and seeing the story from the business owner themselves. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. And it's like the Paul Newman, the Paul, the Paul New Newman method. Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, it, it's just, it's way more personal. Right. And I think too, when it comes to selling a product, people love to hear the story. Um, right now, if you jump onto any podcast about branding and marketing, it always goes back to talking about your story. And it always, in my opinion, it, it's best told by the owner themselves. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, this is just my personal opinion, but I do think that all of the work leading up to the sales point can be outsourced. Like personally, I've outsourced my packaging and branding. Um, I've even outsourced like my co I have a co-packer who's going to co-pack my product for me. So I'm not literally making my product anymore, but I will be on the sales side of things. And so I think it depends too on where your strengths lie. Like you can find a distributor to sell your product for you. And that can really help you get to places that you wouldn't be able to on your own. But there are entrepreneurs that mix it up. Like some entrepreneurs will say, okay, I'm going to do some sales myself, but I'm also going to give um, my product to a distributor to help me you know, reach out to places yep. that I would be able to. So I, I do see a mixed model happening quite often. A lot of owners like to be at the forefront and know what's happening when they go to sales meetings and, you know, um, be in it. So yeah, it's just kind of experience and my opinion there. So getting someone else to make your products, that's probably for a lot of restaurants, maybe down the road, if it does take off, like it's not something you need to consider right away though. No, I mean, especially like Lisa said, if you have a kitchen, <laughs> you're you're basically halfway there to getting your product out there. That is, and what we see with our clients, it's the biggest barrier to entry into the food product market is not is having, a, yeah, not facility. having a commercial yeah. kitchen exactly. So, um, you can get the the machinery to mm -hmm. scale up, maybe if you have the space in your restaurant kitchen. Um, until you get to the point where you just can't produce in your kitchen anymore. And at that point, we have seen people just buy a facility or if they have the money or right. lease out a facility themselves and not go through the co-packer route. So there's so many options. Yeah. I've seen some cooperative kitchens, especially in Edmonton here, where there's a few of them that get together and they cut the cost down on the commercial kitchen and they have that location. Um, I think it's great. I think when you think about restaurants and making that extra money, um, and profitability and stuff like that through these inflation, these inflation times, let's call it, um, making that extra money. If you're already halfway there. Um, I also think the consumer, um, 
maybe looking for some of those unique sauces or dressings or different things that are going to be coming out there. Is there any consumer insights you want to share, Lisa, on on people doing this? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I when you said that, it hit a totally hit a nerve there. Like shop local became huge during the last couple of years. People want to buy kind of hyper local is the word that's being used. Oh, that's a good. That's so, a good one. Hyper local. So if you can get a sandwich that's made down the road. Um, you may skip out on buying something at Loblaws or at, uh, let's not pick on Loblaws all the time, but you know, Sobeys or Metro or wherever you're working for. So, you know, you can, if you can market that shopping local, hyper local and local ingredients, kind of um, tailoring it to like we did this and yeah. uh, you know, sales it that way, it's a fantastic idea. And it's, it, I don't think that that's a trend that's gonna disappear soon. It maybe has tapered off a little bit, but it's still, um, people are aware of what's in their community now because they were kind of in their communities for a tight little time and uh, they wanna support small business in their area as well because they know how important it is. So. I would definitely jump on that if that's something you're you're looking into. This is a great time to do it. Awesome. Well, thank. I'm blown away. First of all, restaurants, you're halfway there, pretty good margins, and uh, people want to buy local, and it helps with inflation and buy from a restaurant any day, right? So, mm-hmm. first of all, thank thank you, Karen. Thank Lisa for really shedding a huge amount of light in this space right now. And uh, we can definitely help a lot of restaurants out by going down this path. And then they can go to both your websites we have there to go check out and to uh, learn more and to possibly work with you guys on creating some products for them and make extra money. It doesn't hurt. <laughs> Sounds good. Awesome. Well, thank you both. Thank you both. And uh, hopefully we, we hear more great stories like this. Here, it's always a blast. So thank you so much for having Lisa on the show with us. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having us too. Awesome. All righty. Well, as we wrap up here for today, folks, um, we'll be back again tomorrow with another show with Lasan on beverages. We're going to be making money with mocktails. So to everyone else out there, have a great rest of your day, and uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you. Bye.